Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm really pleased to have join me today Dr. Margaret Hamburg, who's Commissioner of the FDA and is part of our series of the most interesting people in medicine. <laughs> so, Peggy, it's wonderful to have you with us. And, well, thank uh, you. I thought I'd start off with a little background because uh, you have a pretty remarkable history there. Is Maybe first your family. Um, your parents were both physicians. Your mother was the first African-American to graduate Vassar and also Yale Medical School? That's correct, yeah. And you are perhaps the only family all in the Institute of Medicine? <laughs> I mean, it's, wow. Your father was the president of the Institute of Medicine? That's Medi right. Wow. Okay. So that's a pretty quite a background. And then I, uh, your husband is a researcher in artificial intelligence? Well, he's a computer scientist who has done a lot of work on artificial intelligence, speech recognition, and language translation, and actually now is working on using computer models to predict the markets. Oh, okay. <laughs> so not in healthcare at all. Not in healthcare. Yeah. Neither of our children have any interest in going into medicine, as far as I can tell, at least. And I noted that your kids uh, both had your, not only in your birth certificate, not only you as the mother, but you as the uh, New York City uh, health commissioner. That's right. I think they may be the only two kids in the history of New York whose mother signed the <laughs> birth certificate in two places, yeah. and we're all very proud of that. Although, when I looked at the birth certificate, it, I realized we needed to upgrade it because it really wasn't suitable for framing. <laughs> wow. All right, so back with you, you were at Harvard, you were at Harvard Med School, you were at Columbia. Uh, it was then Cornell New York Hospital. Ah, Cornell, right. And right. Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so then you had some time uh, in NeuroPharm and... Uh, Infectious disease? Well, I actually, I had very strong interests in neuroscience and endocrinology, and I did research at the National Institute of Mental Health on the NIH campus before I started medical school, um, the first summer after medical school, and then I was able to do some research in the neuroscience area at Rockefeller University while I was a medical resident at New York Hospital just uh, next door. So those were very powerful, strong interests. I thought I wanted to really, you know, subspecialize and do academic medicine and follow in some ways in the footsteps of my parents who uh, were um, professors and physician scientists at Stanford Medical School when I was growing up. But uh, I took a little bit of a different path, and in fact, they ended up broadening huh. out into huh. areas of, of policy and public service as well. Maybe you had an influence on them. <laughs> So uh, you had quite a rich uh, background in uh, public service, government, HHS, and different levels, uh, NIH, uh, and of course, uh, the was it six years that you were at New York City uh, as That's the right. Commissioner of Health? Yes. You interacted with Rudy Giuliani there? I did. I actually had the privilege of working as the city's health commissioner three years under Mayor Dinkins and three years under Mayor Giuliani. And I really actually take great pride in that because I believe that a job like health commissioner of New York City or FDA commissioner should be very much a professional job driven by science, um, medical care needs, and the best public health practice. And so to be able to serve under a liberal Democrat and a, a you know, fairly visible Republican, um, I think, you know, speaks to... Um, the ability to, to, to serve in a role as a professional, regardless of the more complex politics of the environment, and the importance of these roles in terms of continuity, regardless of political party. Yeah, and then I know you did um, many things there during your tenure, but uh, working on TB, HIV, and uh, a lot of great accomplishments. Uh, that yeah, it was a fascinating up. time. Mm. Wow. So before you came to the FDA, you were at the Nuclear Threat Initiative That's for right. several years. That confuses a lot of <laughs> yeah, people. Tell us about that. Well, it was called the Nuclear Threat Initiative, but it actually was focused on reducing the threat of weapons of mass destruction. It was a new foundation started in January of 2001 by Ted Turner and uh, a former senator, Sam Nunn. And they asked me to come on board to um, help stand up the foundation and start a program on biological threats. And I said mm -hmm. I would come if we could focus both on biological weapons and biological terrorism, but also naturally occurring uh, biological threats, including threats like Ebola, 
um, because I think we all recognize that Mother Nature can be a pretty effective mm. terrorist in her own way. And these were interests that I'd actually developed back when I was New York City Health Commissioner. I was in that position the first time the World Trade Center was bombed, so I started taking domestic terrorism very seriously and started focusing on the areas of responsibility for a public health agency and the, the need for better public health preparedness against a range of threats. And of course, in New York City, it was also a, sub, a hub for international travel, and it meant that we had to be aware of what was happening elsewhere in the world in terms of imported disease and strategies to address that, you know, very similar to what is going on now with Ebola. And then also, you know, we were dealing with, you know, very serious epidemics of disease in New York City, including HIV and the resurgence of tuberculosis mm -hmm. now in um, more frightening forms with the development of drug resistance. So I really became deeply committed to the area of biological threats and the role of public health preparedness in addressing them. Well, speaking of prepared, I don't know anybody who could have been better prepared to take on uh, back uh, five and a half years ago to be the FDA commissioner. <laughs> so has this been a dream job for you? Not at all. You know, I joke that if someone had said to me even a month before I was approached for the FDA job, could you see yourself as FDA commissioner, I probably would have put down a large sum of money with the answer no. Uh, but it's been a terrific opportunity and, you know, really an inspiring place to work in terms of its critical and unique mission. We're a science-based regulatory agency with a mission to promote and protect the health of the public. We are unique. We matter in people's lives every day. The, the products that we regulate and oversee range from the safety and effectiveness of of drugs and vaccines and medical devices and other um, uh, biologic products and medical products to the safety of the blood supply, the safety of most of the uh, U.S. food supply, dietary supplements, <laughs> cosmetics, um, and most recently, tobacco products. So, and we, you know, we regulate products that actually are estimated to account for um, a little more than 20 cents of every dollar that consumers spend on products. So we matter in terms of impact on the lives of individuals, families, and communities, but also, of course, more broadly on the economy. Oh, sure. I mean, you're looking, you're overseeing a trillion dollars of the economy a, a year, and that's a lot to look after. <laughs> uh, right. I can understand. So let's get into some of the, the, uh, the challenges that you've had to uh, face uh, along the way. One of the ones that hits me um, uh, uh, straight away is the Plan B back in 2001. <laughs> yes. So you had a really whole um, emergency contraception thing set up and then um, the Secretary uh, Sebelius at the time said, no, no, we're not going to do that. W that. Was that upsetting to go through that? Well, you know, it was a difficult situation, um, but a situation where I felt that what I needed to do as commissioner was quite clear. Our job is to look at the science and the data. Um, the, the company that made this product, Plan B, had approached us with an application for an over-the-counter availability um, that would decrease the, the age of access uh, to this product. And they had done the studies, the, yeah. the science clearly supported approval of their application, and that is, you know, the compass I mean, that we need to use for decision making. Yeah, it seemed to get trumped by politics. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it's a complex yeah. um, political and emotional issue. We all wish that we lived in a world <laughs> where, um, you know, 14-year-olds don't have to access emergency contraception, um, and if they do find themselves in that situation, that they would have a trusted adult, either a parent or a health care provider, to help them make that decision. But in that moment of crisis, you know, there also are clear health and um, behavioral benefits to being able to access this product. And we knew from long experience with this product and data that had been presented as part of studies done by the company, um, that it was safe and effective and could be used appropriately in the over-the-counter setting 
by the individual and, and eventually got straightened out. And right? it is now in yeah. the marketplace. Now, what about um, the uh, the, uh, the whole uh, compounding? The, you know, they're trying to regulate these yeah. these rogue. Uh, pharmacy compounders, that must have been a well, tough one, huh? This was another complicated area um, for FDA and certainly an area that had a, a strong impact on the, the health and well-being of the American people. And it's an issue that we continue to be deeply involved in. The issue is that there are compounding pharmacies in every neighborhood, really, of this country that are, you know, very legitimate pharmacies regulated by the state um, in terms of the practice of pharmacy, that, that are available to make products that, that people need. If you're in need of a product but you have a swallowing problem, the compounding pharmacy can, can take the pharmaceutical that you need and prepare it in a way that, that you can use it, or many pediatric um, uh, treatment needs may need to be compounded in order to make it uh, more usable by a younger age child. So that has clear benefits. The problem was that the industry was evolving as the medical care system was evolving and some of the compounding pharmacies had shifted into a mode that was not so much the neighborhood compounder making a, a product with a specific prescription for a specific patient, but they were making large quantities of often complex mm. products, yeah. sterile injectables uh, were a particular concern where if it's not done right, it can create real quality risks and concerns for patients. And then these were being marketed um, across the country. It came to a head, it had been an area of concern for a while, the gray areas in terms of, of practice and ensuring the best products for people who need them. Um, but it really came to a head when there was a contaminated s steroid oh product gosh, that yeah. led to um, the deaths of, of, mm. of many people over, over 70, as I recall, yeah, yeah. And, and illness in, in hundreds more. Yeah, that's amazing. But the, I mean, I, what you have to, you know, these things that are uh, never would, it's almost like getting ambushed, the things that are out there, it's uh, hard to fathom. But what about the opiate thing? I mean, that's a recent flap. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a big concern about opiate abuse, and so maybe some comments about that Yeah. One. Well, you know, FDA is always working in an environment where there are complex decisions to be made and a balancing of risks and benefits and uh, working within a legal regulatory framework as well. The opiate issue is a, a huge area of concern in terms of the public health epidemic that we're facing with opiate addiction, abuse and misuse, overdose, and preventable death. At the same time, there are many, many patients, as you know as a physician, um, that need mm -hmm. effective pain management, sure. either for acute disease post-surgery or for the treatment of chronic conditions. And we need to balance um, those issues. We need to assure access to safe and effective pain medications, um, but recognize that there is this broader context of abuse. So we, uh, we are doing a number of things related um, to this issue. Importantly, we're working um, with the research community and with product sponsors to try to develop opiate drugs that are, are more resistant to abuse. And that's a hard challenge. The science and technology is evolving, um, but there are approaches to make um, some of these drugs less uh, abusable in terms of mm. you can't, if you crush them, they turn into a gel, and so you can't impulsively inject or mm. snort. Um, and some, some other interesting and more sophisticated technologies that are in development. But it's a hard challenge, and most of the abuse is, in fact, the oral mechanism, uh, and that's the hardest to address because sure. you want to have the drug yeah, yeah. actually available uh, to the patient um, when they take it right, for right. treatment of pain. We're also trying to work with the, the scientific community and um, product developers to find other pain medications, especially in the chronic disease area. Opiates are often not the most appropriate treatment, but they may end up being the only available sure. treatment 
for patients. Um, but we're seeing new categories of, of treatment for certain kinds of pain, and I think that will make a difference in, in better providing care for patients and also reducing uh, the, the public health epidemic of opiate abuse. Yeah, well, that sounds like a potentially great yeah. solution. And I, we need to do a better job with treatment. I yeah. mean, I think that we don't have the best drugs for the treatment of addiction, and I think as physicians, we're not always adequately trained about how to recognize addiction, addiction, and we don't have the addiction treatment networks that we need when a referral needs to be made. And frankly, I think as physicians, we all need to learn more uh, about appropriate use of these powerful opiate drugs. Yeah. Well, you touched on tobacco and then addiction, and then it brings me to e-cigarettes. Yes. Any thoughts about those? Well, this is an area where FDA is, you know, at the present time seeking the authority to actually regulate e-cigarettes. At the present time, they're outside of our regulatory authority. Legislation was passed um, a number of years ago that for the first time gave FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products, but it was uh, cigarettes and, and smokeless tobacco and roll your own tobacco, but a number of tobacco products that are, are currently in the marketplace weren't included in that mm -hmm. initial legislation. But we have undertaken a, a process to extend our regulatory authority over these other tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. So, so, you know, that's a critical first step. And then I think we need to look very hard at e-cigarettes. You know, it's interesting. The public health and medical community is quite divided yeah, on the appropriate yeah, really. role of e-cigarettes. You know, there are many who are deeply concerned, and I can understand why, about the attractiveness of, of these new products, especially to young people. And we're seeing the uptake of use um, going up in adolescent populations, but the numbers are still relatively small, but you know, they're flavored, you know, you can get um, mint Oreo flavored e-cigarettes and other things that are clearly, you know, uh, targeted to be attractive to yeah. kids. And you don't want to see young people start up an addiction like nicotine and then go on to um, combustible cigarettes and other tobacco products that not only have the nicotine, but the other carcinogens and toxins as well. Many people you know, are encouraged that e-cigarettes can be a useful tool for smoking cessation and shifting mm. away from all of those harms of traditional combustible cigarettes. So we're actually at FDA putting a lot of money into research to better understand uh, e-cigarettes and other tobacco products and their uses as well. We're working with academic institutions institutions doing grants, and we're working with NIH doing a major longitudinal study that I think will give us a lot more important information as we continue to address, you know, the critical challenge of tobacco use and smoking, which remains the, the leading preventable cause oh, of, know, of death amazing. in this country. We, we don't seem to still be in touch with that. That's right. Now, speaking of a lot of money, supplements, 30 billion, 40 billion a year, and the FDA doesn't really have authority over that, I guess, right? Well, you know, we do not actually review dietary supplements for safety and effectiveness before they go into the marketplace the way that we do for medical drugs and devices. Is that because that industry's lobbied to, to prevent that, or? Well, the, 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 the legal construct the regulatory framework that we have been given by Congress um, asks us to, to monitor the safety of dietary supplements in the marketplace. Um, companies are required to report serious adverse events to us. We have the power when there's a problem to recall dietary supplements, and we do have the authority to also monitor the production of dietary supplements in terms of of the quality of manufacturing, but it is only one aspect. And I think actually many American consumers assume that FDA is actually yeah. doing more yeah. in the regulatory oversight of these products and actually is engaged in assessing safety and efficacy pre-market. Another area that's uh, um, somewhat controversial is consumer genomics. And mm -hmm. uh, companies like 23andMe and others, and of course, uh, some people want to get there 
genomic data. And of course, there's a lot of other companies that are out there with marketing very questionable uh, genotype data. Uh, any thoughts about where that might be headed over time? Well, obviously, we've entered a whole new era thanks to advances in science and technology, and we're very enthused about the opportunities of precision medicine and the opportunity to really develop better drugs that can target individuals in new and important ways in terms of their specific um, individual characteristics, their disease characteristics, and their needs. And diagnostics, genomic diagnostics, um, and especially next generation sequencing is a very important component of what is already happening and, and what will happen in the future. We support the notion of consumers and their healthcare providers having access to this kind of information. But we do feel strongly, whether it's a genetic test or any other kind of a diagnostic, that the test be accurate and reliable. If, if important decisions are going to be made, if that information is really going to be actionable in critical ways, consumers deserve accurate and reliable information. Got it. Well, so the, such a broad thing as far as you not only have the U.S., but you have the whole world <laughs> in terms of inspecting facilities. Yeah. and. It's actually uh, beyond um, the comprehension about the responsibilities that you have. And so one last thing I wanted to ask you about, which was um, about the cost of drugs. Mm -hmm. And in other countries, uh, there's um, a review by government. And uh, in this country, somehow we've been immune to that. That is, uh, the FDA reviews everything independent of the cost. And now we have you know, runaway specialty drug costs, cancer, new drugs, and in fact, many new approvals, of course, in mm -hmm. recent times. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any, um, any checks and balances on these costs. And the other countries are at a fraction of the price that mm -hmm. Americans are paying. So will we ever get to a time when that is reined in, you think? Well, it is true, of course, that we do have a very different system in many ways than, than other countries, and the FDA is specifically prohibited by law from, from taking cost into account when we do our scientific review. Can we change the um, law? You know, I actually, it's a complex question mm. and it's worthy of discussion, but I actually think there's value in FDA you know, focusing on the science. I have found that that has been a very important, if not essential, compass um, for our work. But I think that, that we have to recognize the broader context in which these products will be used. Of course, we have an agency, CMS, that, that makes decisions about reimbursement, and they um, have a very powerful role in terms of setting mm -hmm. um, uh, costs in terms of what they are willing to pay, and they also, I think, influence other private payers as well. So, so there is a reimbursement framework that is active in this ecosystem. But I think you know we have reached a point that we have to have a, a national debate yeah, about these I, issues. We have to really sort out how we're going to deal with all of this. I think. My hope is that advances in science and technology will continue to bring us new, better drugs, but maybe drugs where the, the development costs mm. are actually lowered because the sophistication of the drug development process is dramatically oh. increased. But right. at the same time, we also have to look at the whole ecosystem and recognize that we just can't continue uh, to be able to provide the care that American patients expect without addressing the broader set of cost issues. Well, yeah, back to your point about individualized uh, medicine in terms even of drug device development and whatnot. Now, um, you've been an incredibly dedicated uh, person in public service and I think a great inspiration to the medical community and also to women in, in science. <laughs> I thought maybe we would close to what some things that you'd like to say to the, uh, the physician audience as to um, the, what you've learned and, okay. and what impact you might have to, yeah. to inspire others. Well, I, you know, number one, I hope that all physicians and others in the broader medical community 
will think about public service as an important application of their knowledge, skills, and expertise. Public service is incredibly rewarding, and you know, so it's a bit of a shift from the care and commitment that you give to an individual patient to stepping back and really mm -hmm. doing that for an entire population. In fact, when I first became health commissioner in New York City, my uh, great aunt Winnie was very upset because she, she wanted me to be a real doctor, and she couldn't understand why I was throwing away my medical education, and my father tried to sort of calm her down and say, well, she is a real doctor. She just now has about 8 million patients, <laughs> and now I have you know, more than 310 million patients, I guess, as a pretty big practice. commissioner. Yeah. But public service is enormously rewarding, and you certainly in these jobs feel that every day you're making a difference. You know, I think the, the other thing is that we need to recognize in medicine that we are working in a much more complex environment and we have to, to think about and deal with patients in terms of all of the influences on their life and all the different um, policies and programs that are impacting them, all of the real world circumstances, whether it's poverty or other uh, pressures, and by you know being engaged in health policy, it's made me really look at things in a much more textured way. And all of the problems before us are are complex and multi-determined, and the solutions have to be multifaceted. And most of the the real problems that underlie medical care and our desire to promote health uh, are not going to be resolved simply in a doctor's office or in a hospital setting. We really have to step back and look at, at all of the determinants oh, so, of health. So well exemplified by the current Ebola crisis. That's uh, right. Sure. Well, I, we're all grateful to you, not just uh, for the willingness to have this conversation, but for all that you've done to uh, you. look after the American public. <laughs> and I think set another great standard for the FDA. Uh, so thank you so much, Peggy, for joining us. And thank all of you for uh, um, this interesting discussion that we've had. We'd be interested in your comments, and we'd like to keep this uh, series of, of visiting with the most interesting people in medicine going. So thanks very much for joining uh, this one-on-one -on -one for Medscape.